Um, so in your understanding, how does the internet work? Hi everyone, we're here today with Anch for a security engineering interview. For those of you who aren't already familiar with Exponent, Exponent helps you get your dream tech career with our online courses, expert coaching, peer-to-peer -peer mock interviewing platform, and interview question database. Check it out at tryexponent.com. Okay, thanks so much for being here with us today, Anch. We're excited to have you teach us a little bit about security engineering. Uh, would you quickly introduce yourself for the viewers? Sure. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Ansh. I am currently a student studying cybersecurity and computer science at Drexel University. In the past, I've interned with Susquehanna International Group uh, and Google. And this summer, I'm, I'll be returning to Google as a security engineering intern working in the offensive security team. That's really exciting. Okay, so let's get started with our first question. The first question is, um, so in your understanding, how does the internet work? So if you were to navigate to like google.com, for example, like what actually happens under the hood? Yeah, um, so the way I understand it is that the internet is just an extremely large network. So it functions the same way that a typical network would. So for example, if my computer were to reach out to google.com, um, every computer or every uh, internet capable device has a network interface card. Uh, this network interface card sort of, uh, you know, has the MAC address hard-coded on it uh, for every device and helps, um, helps the device communicate over a network. And it has a list of trusted DNS servers. Uh, the computer reaches out to one of these servers. So for example, if I enter google.com in my web browser, um, my computer will ask the network interface card to reach out to a DNS server and convert google.com into, into its um, relevant IP address. So once, once, the, once my computer recognizes the IP address or translates um, the actual English name that we enter into an IP address, it then forwards the connection over the network and tries to reach out to google.com. Um, if, if, for example, my trusted list of DNS servers don't recognize um, you know, where a particular domain name exactly leads to, for example, they don't recognize google.com, uh, my trusted DNS server would reach out to its trusted DNS servers and uh, you know, iteratively query more and more servers to figure out whether this domain name can be resolved into an IP address. So once the web address is located, um, the client, in this case, my computer, would initiate like an SSL handshake with the server and establish a session um, for data to flow and for the server and client to communicate. Great. OK, so once that happens, can you tell me a little bit more about how that SSL handshake actually works? Sure. Um, so the SSL handshake basically takes place in five steps. Uh, initially, the first two steps involve uh, the client hello and the server hello, where uh, both the client and server reach out to each other, specify things like SSL version, uh, Cypher settings, and session-specific data. Um, after that, the client authenticates the server's certificate. Uh, so when you see an HTTPS on it, uh, there's typically a certificate issued by a certificate authority in play that uh, basically validates the identity of the server or uh, validates the identity of the website. Once this uh, server certificate is uh, authenticated by a client, in this case, my computer, um, the client basically creates a, something like a pre-master secret uh, for the session and encrypts it with the server's public key. Uh, you know, this part uses asymmetric cryptography. So the server, uh, the server receives um, the pre-master secret that's been encrypted with its own public key, and it uses its private key to decrypt this uh, pre-master secret. And beyond this, both the client and server perform certain steps to generate a master secret after, agree, uh, after agreeing upon a particular cipher. Um, once, once the cipher is agreed upon, uh, the client and server then um, agree to exchange messages uh, in an encrypted format with the with the newly generated session key. Um, so SSL typically uses both symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Uh, the first um, negotiation for the pre-master certificate, uh, sorry, the pre-master secret happens uh, with asymmetric cryptography, mm -hmm. but later when data is actually being transmitted, it's symmetric cryptography because symmetric cryptography is just faster to encrypt and decrypt. 
Okay, cool. Um, thank you for the very thorough explanation. So I'm curious to hear more about um, the symmetric and asymmetric encryption. What What is the difference between the two and when would you use one versus the other? Gotcha. So um, the primary difference between symmetric and asymmetric cryptography is the use of keys. Um, symmetric cryptography uses a single key that has to be given to all parties um, who are privy, privy, privy to the information or the data. So it's, for example, like I send you a locked suitcase and there's only one key to open it. Whereas asymmetric encryption has two sets of keys, which is a public key and a private key. Um, and I would encrypt, uh, say, a suitcase using a public key, send it over to you, and you could only decrypt it if you have the private key. Uh, one of the most popular encryption uh, standards in asymmetric encryption is RSA encryption. Um, the difference in use cases arises if you would prefer speed over security, you would use symmetric encryption. Um, however, if you prefer, uh, if you don't mind the speed and the extra latency, uh, you could go for asymmetric encryption, which would be the more secure option. Okay, great. Um, okay, so you mentioned then that a common type is uh, RSA encryption. So can you tell me a little bit more about how that would work and how you would decrypt something that's been RSA encrypted? So it's very difficult to decrypt RSA encryption. Um, RSA encryption typically takes about seven to eight steps to encrypt data in itself. And it primarily works on two really large prime numbers, um, about maybe 20 digits each or higher. Mm -hmm. And what it does is it performs, um, it performs certain mathematical operations, such as uh, taking the product of these prime numbers, uh, calculating, uh, calculating the Euler phi lambda function of the same, and also um, using a randomly generated number in the mix. Um, a few years ago, I took part in a competition where they tried to um, have a challenge to decrypt a very uh, primitive RSA encryption that didn't use a large prime number. It just used a prime number of like two to three digits. And mm -hmm. the, way, the way I sort of figured out the challenge and uh, you know, managed to decrypt a simple RSA encryption was um, you know, given a public key, which would typically contain two numbers, we'll call them N and E. Um, mm -hmm we could prime factorize the number n or the first number in the public key and try and figure out what those two prime numbers are uh, that can, you know, uh, that are used to generate the public key. Uh, once we have these two prime numbers, it's, uh, it's a little straightforward to calculate the Euler phi function and the value for that as well. The difficult part comes to, um, the difficult part comes to trying and uh, guessing the, second number in the private key. The private key contains numbers that we can call N and D. So we already mm -hmm. have the value for N from the public key, but the second value in the private key um, denoted by D has to be calculated through, um, has to be calculated through a little bit of, uh, uh, I guess, discrete math, you could call it. So it would be equivalent to taking um, E inverse multiplied by uh, one plus K into the value of phi we calculate. Now, this value of k has to be iteratively uh, calculated in somewhat of a greedy approach, um, such that the resultant number of this entire operation uh, would be a whole number. Um, and that's how I sort of navigated uh, trying and decrypting RSA encryption. Gotcha. And could you tell me what N and D actually are in the private key, like how you use them? Sure. So um, RSA, RSA encryption uh, basically works on a lot of modulus functions. So if you have, if you have a ciphertext, you could um, the ciphertext raised to the power of d, uh, which is the number second number in the private key, uh, mm -hmm. would result uh, modded by n would result in um, you know decrypting the traffic that you've encrypted. And what is n here? So n is just uh, the product of the two prime numbers that are used for the encryption. Right. Okay. Perfect. Okay, so let's switch tax a, a little bit to something uh, involving some coding. So um, one thing that's commonly done is that IP addresses often need to be defanged. Uh, could you show me how to do that in code? Sure. Um, so I'm just going to switch to this screen here. Um, typically, I've seen IP, IP addresses in the IPv4 format typically contain um, four octets or four sections. 
and it would look something like 192, 168, 01. Um, yes. if, if I were to defang it, do you want me to um, sort of remove the period entirely or would you want me to um, encase the period in some sort of brackets as such? They should be encased in brackets. Okay. Um, so to, I'm assuming I would receive the IP address as string input. Yep. So I could create a function called defang and that would receive an IP as a string. And what, so you would like the defanged IP address as the output. Um, so mm -hmm. that's string output. And I guess the simplest way, uh, since I'm using Python would be uh, to simply use the built-in function called replace, where I can take, um, I can take the string itself and simply replace every instance of the period with every, uh, with a period in brackets. And this should, um, this should be a viable solution to defanging any IP address in the IPv4 format. Are you able to do this without using any built-in functions like replace? Um, I think so. So the most, uh, the most straightforward approach I can think of would simply be string manipulation. So instead of, instead of using a built-in function, I could use a for loop. So for each character in the IP address, um, I could have a simple conditional statement that says if uh, ch equals to the period, um, then I could say that uh, then I could also have like an answer variable here, uh, which would simply be an empty string. And like this, if ch equals to a period, then I could simply replace it with uh, our defanged character. Um, otherwise, I would just append. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I would just append the character uh, to the final answer, and we could return the answer itself. Okay. Perfect. Um, can you test out this solution really quickly? Sure. Um, so let's say we have if you run the code and yeah, we have a defined IP address. Okay, awesome. Um, so congrats on finishing the interview. I think this is a great place for us to pause. I'd love to hear from you first. Like, how do you think this interview went? Like, what do you think went well? And what do you think you would want to improve on? Um, I think overall, I think the interview went well. Um, if I were to uh, pick something to improve upon, it would definitely be, uh, you know, my understanding of the SSL handshake. Maybe I could use a simpler analogy to explain things. Um, like, for example, in the first question, I was able to use um, the example of how my computer would connect to say google.com. And in the, in the question about cryptography, I was able to use an example of like a simple suitcase with a padlock on it. Um, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I would, uh, I would say I could improve. Great. Yeah. Um, I agree. I think a lot of things went really well. Like I like that for a lot of the really content complex concepts, you were able to explain them uh, in simpler terms and using concrete examples. I think that really demonstrates how deep an understanding you have of these concepts. And you were also able to show like extensions of that theoretical knowledge too. So you were able to discuss like possible use cases of um, each type of encryption and also like how you would actually apply it um, in real world scenarios. Um, I also like that like um, your code here is very, very clear, very easy to read. Um, I do think it would be helpful to actually like uh, proactively test your code yourself to demonstrate right. that like you have those like testing skills, you know. Um, and then one last thing is that when explaining the RSA encryption and decryption algorithm, I think it could help to be a little bit more clear about exactly what the algorithm is. So right. I think sometimes you use terms like like 
uh, like variables like n and d and e, but um, without having explained first what they actually are, even though the interviewer likely knows what they actually are, but um, it's important that you demonstrate that you also know what it is. Um, right. Yeah, how does that all sound? Yeah, that, that sounds about right, um, definitely. Yeah, okay, great. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Anj. Um, I think we've learned a lot from you. And uh, to everybody watching, good luck on your upcoming interviews. Thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons below to let us know that this video is valuable for you. And of course, check out hundreds more videos just like this at tryexponent.com. Thanks for watching and good luck on your upcoming interview.